My name is Matt Keurig, and I'm on the OpenUSD ecosystem team at NVIDIA. And I'm here to present some principles and patterns to help you define an asset structure to help your teams collaborate in OpenUSD. Later, Will is going to present the DaVinci Workshop dataset and describe some of these principles in action. One of the challenges of discussing asset structure is just the overloading of the term. For some people, asset, model, element, and component are roughly synonymous. For others, each might have, a very explicit and have explicit and divergent semantics. So to level set, we're going to define an asset as, a cont as containers of resources, layers, textures, volume fields, that have three fundamental features. First, it's something you want to share and reuse. So it needs a name so that people know how to access and identify it. Second, once it's shared, it might need to be upgraded. So it needs to be versioned. So version sy versioning systems can be you know, very complex and robust, but they can also be informal. Just a chat message to your team saying, hey, I've upgraded the asset with higher resolution textures. Let me know if it causes any problems. And then our white paper, Principles of Scalable Asset Structure in OpenUSD, um, which is now on the uh, NVIDIA OpenUSD documentation portal, um, lays out structure as a third aspect of the definition of an asset. We think that asset structure can really empower the scalability of, of a team. It can facilitate collaboration, reuse of content, variation, and upgrading and refining of data. And so the white paper lays out four principles of asset structure. Legibility, do the names effectively represent the intent and type of their representation? Modularity, does it facilitate iterative improvement of the asset? Performance, is it fast to use, does it feel speedy? Navigability, um, does it facilitate discovery of elements while still retaining some flexibility? We think a reusable modular asset requires thinking of uh, assets as having an interface. Users are going to need to have a single layer to open or reference into their scenes. These interface layers often have one or more entry point prims, the targets of the references arc. Entry points may contain summary data, like you know, the extents hit um, for bounding information, um, but then they can also be parameterized, either with variant sets or asset level prim vars. The entry point prim and the child prims and properties that are intended for downstream editing can make up the asset's prim interface. With this variety of flavors of composition operators, it can be hard to know what arcs and features you need when structuring an interface layer. But we think there's a good principled starting point, a referenceable interface layer that contains a payload with sublayers. We call this the reference payload pattern. So why start with all three? Well, each composition operator has different semantics and performance characteristics. When building an asset structure, runtime performance of the asset is determined by the cost of resolving the layers identifier, opening the resolved layers file format, and then finally composing the open layers contents. A sublayer, which is often considered the simplest arc to compose, also ends up being one of the hardest to prevent from resolving and opening. So a harmonized usage of references, payloads, and sublayers can give the right balance of performance, modularity, and navigability. Let's see the reference payload pattern in action in a few different assets. So here we have a simple, what we're calling an atomic model structure. In this case, we call it an atomic model because all of its dependencies are encapsulated within a single version. Its dependencies get anchored either directly or indirectly to the root interface layer. And this, if you're familiar with the concept of model hierarchy, these are often component models. And so we use all three, ref, all three uh, composition operators, references, payloads, and sublayers here. The payload allows us to defer the loading of the layers that are expensive to resolve and open and compose. However, it still provides access to fields in it's the asset interface layer when the payload is unloaded. So you can see the variants that are available, the bounds of the asset without ever downloading and loading the, uh, the payload. Um, this could result in ultimately less payloads being loaded, and that can be a performance win. Um, finally, we sort of use sublayers inside the payload contents, which preserves the ability to mute layers. But if we weren't concerned with that, we could easily align that and inline the layers into the payload. We can build more complicated structures on top of that basic pattern. So we can start with our apartment building here, which similarly has a referenceable interface layer with a payload. But we can also add additional references to other assets. Um, here we have an apartment building, and we've placed a flower pot on the porch. We're, here we're using references, and we're relying on the asset maintainer of the flower pot 
to pr maintain its own interface layer. It's where the payload belongs, what fields b belong above the payload. And so um, here we have an asset which has a mixture of payloads and references. We might just have uh, a simple asset which, um, which is just contains references. So just a simple model that's aggregating a bunch of buildings inside of a neighborhood. And this could even just be a single layer. If our neighborhood was complex enough, we might choose to add a payload later. That's a choice we can make later. Lastly, the last model structure I kind of wanted to touch on was what we're calling a selector model structure. Here we've added a variant set to a variant set at the top level. The variant set allows us to slot in a concept, in this case a street lamp, um, place it in a scene, and then decide which specific street lamp we want to choose later. Maybe the street lamp hasn't been finished. Maybe we just have a rough temp version. Um, you know, uh, it gives us kind of a catalog that can evolve over time. And from a performance um, standpoint, the references are all defined within the variant. So only the selected reference will ever be, uh, will ever be resolved, opened, and then composed. You can imagine taking this concept of um, this reference kind of variant, the variant of references pattern um, further in some interesting ways. And you potentially provide sort of a persistent load state or mutable references if you have content that you want to be able to disable. So here's sort of those, uh, here's you can see those patterns kind of summarized here. We have our neighborhood aggregate asset that just references our more complicated apartment package which contains our atomic flower pot asset. And so when starting out to build an asset structure, start with that reference payload pattern. A lot of reusable assets exhibit this pattern. If you don't need uh, some of the operators or some of that complexity, feel free to go simple and align the things that seem like they're adding weight or bloat to your structure. Complicated assets like architecture sometimes require complicated model structures. So feel free to build more complicated assemblages using additional payload or layer payloads or layer stacks. And then when you take into account uh, variants, inherits, and specializes arcs, you can get creative and really go beyond this, these kind of standard patterns. When you build these structures, you, remember to use sort of these four principles to evaluate um, the success of your structure. Make sure that things are legible for your users, things are modular, and make sure it's easy to upgrade the things that are important to upgrade. Uh, things still retain uh, speed, they're easy to open, and uh, they're, the, the necessary information you need is easy to find, and it's navigable. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to Will, who's going to talk about the DaVinci Workshop. So I'm Will Whaley. Pipeline engineer on the Creative 3D team here at NVIDIA. Before joining, I was a digital supervisor at DreamWorks Animation and a pipeline supervisor at Rhythm and Youth Studios. Uh, the Creative 3D team uh, produces real-time, offline, and interactive content with a small team of experienced and savvy artists. We created the forthcoming DaVinci uh, workshop example data set, which I'll use to illustrate uh, the principles of Matthew just went over. So in these slides, I'm going to bold the terms from the glossary in Matt's white paper, and I'm going to underline the word asset. I'm going to underline the word asset when I mean an encapsulated model and its relevant auxiliary data. So I'm thinking about a character or a prop if you're in an animation pipeline. So a little more about my team to set some context around the decisions that are going to be reflected in the data set. Um, so we author custom assets and we ingest assets from third parties. Uh, we choose names for people and not for processes. Our mission is to utilize emerging technology, and we focus on getting assets to artists as, as fast as possible. Um, we have really short schedules that we have to deal with. So as a result, um, whole asset versioning isn't a priority, meaning the encapsulated asset and the 15 or hundreds of files that make it up, we don't, we don't version those as a cohesive unit, but we do version individual files. So uh, our asset prem interfaces are pretty pretty lean, uh, complex asset structures like environments, locations are not a priority. And we're pretty forgiving um, of our prim hierarchies and naming to a certain degree. So that said, I'm gonna, gonna focus on my examples on a prop asset. It's named Hammer and it's aligned and it's alignment with the principles. I'm gonna use the term user work streams, which Matt defines as user facing units of work that may overlap or operate in parallel, typically modeled in layer stacks. 
And so it's just a term to describe data organization that aligns with our asset structure. Other workflows may call it departments or contributions or production steps. So first up, I'll go through legibility and navigability, um, which are a little bit easier for me to demo together. So I want to start with the files and directories that you see on disk. So remember that the asset clients are you and me and artist, um, and they'll be exposed to these through browsers and interfaces. So first, the story structure is informative. Um, it tells you that this asset is a prop named Hammer. Uh, the asset interface layer is named after the asset. It's Hammer. It's not Hammer V2 or Hammer Final or some other nondescript name. The user work streams are stored in directories that clearly communicate their purpose. So geometry, material, preview, proxy, and rig, hopefully are obvious. Uh, work stream layer names also mirror the purpose, uh, and their extensions indicate which layers can be inspected or edited if you're bold, and which cannot. Uh, some work streams employ variant sets for asset parameterization. And when this happens, uh, let's see. Uh, by convention, the work stream name is the variant set name. And then the subdirectory names, they are the variant names. And the layer names are just a combination of those two. So the asset parameterization carries on into the scene description. So I'll take a look uh, at the material work stream layer where I'll reiterate my previous points. Yeah, so now the work stream name, you see that is the variant set. And then the subdirectory names are the variants in our, in our variant set. So you can also see the convention. Oh, it's okay here. I got lost myself. Huh. Sorry. Uh, so then you can see the, in the UI of USD Composer that um, the asset file name and the asset path, the second line there, is informative to the user. So a strict naming convention uh, is enforced for clarity and cross-domain compatibility. So asset names must be Pascal case and they're bookend, bookended by letters. Uh, the reasons being the same asset will be referenced into a scene more than one time. So trailing digits introduce some ambiguity. Uh, underscores are commonly used as separators and that might imply some organizational meaning that doesn't really exist in the asset. And not all file system legal characters uh, are legal in OpenUSD, and we want the naming convention alignment across those domains. So there's some examples you can see where it's ambiguous whether the asset name is R2D, um, and target like has a lowercase uh, lettering. So it's not clear if that's an asset or is that something that I've created and seen that I need. And then is it one tree with two houses? Uh, so finally, the last example is kind of what our assets look like. It's an asset name and then the use one. So now you've seen the disk organization and naming convention. I'm going to reiterate the importance of uh, naming in our data set. Right? So the, the asset name has a connotation. So it's a thing. And whenever you see it, it you think of that, that thing. Um, so we want to be consistent because the clients expect and anticipate that consistency. So we use the same name across our storage, uh, asset interface layers, the entry point prem, and then in the asset info. So all those, all those places map to the conceptual same thing. So if we start encoding metadata into that name, like our artists are going to have to decode that every time they look at it, and we want to avoid that. So as you can see in the examples in the UI, the stage view and the file dialog, uh, hopefully, at least if you're, you're having to dig in assets that way, it kind of makes it clear which ones you should use. So now focusing on the stage viewer, uh, you can see the standard scopes underneath our interface prim. So we have proxy, geo, looks, and skeleton. Um, looks is a little bit of an outlier, but it contains our, material, our materials. And we use looks that way with the, the uppercase because that's the standard in USD Composer. So it's familiar with our artist. It's where materials are going to go by default. So it's also worth noting that proxy and geo are sibling in our structure just to try to reduce the prim depth. So Matt said modularity. Uh, a modular structure promotes iterative improvement. And that, that's basically the pipeline philosophy we have. In fact, when we we're building out our asset structure, the first thing we had was geometry and material. And then preview and proxy and rig were added later on. So we'll take another look at the, at the storage structure. Um, so first, the work streams were well organized uh, and designed for growth. So they're encapsulated and expansion is basically limited by the file system. Same thing goes with our variants whenever we use those. Um, the name to the asset interface layer, it doesn't change. 
The entry point prem doesn't change, uh, providing a stable interface. So once a client establishes a reference to an asset, they can rely on that, uh, on, its, on its existence. Um, additionally, as new work streams are introduced, they can be composed onto the entry point prem as payloads uh, or references, which <coughs> augment the asset through composition without changing the interface. Uh, entry point prems can be or are parameterized with variant sets which have defaults, um, so adding more is non-instructive and, and pretty easy in the structure we have. So I also mentioned that textures and materials are stored relative to the work stream layer or the variant layer, and that helps in the encapsulation of the asset. So we use anchored asset paths throughout. So finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, performance. So to the right, you see a heavily, heavily pared down uh, contents of an asset interface layer with the entry point prem highlighted in blue uh, and a work stream layer. So in this example, it's a mouthful, uh, the reference payload pattern is used in the asset interface layer for the material work stream layer. Right? So you can see the asset interface layer references the material work stream layer. And the work stream layer parameterizes the entry point prem with a variant set. And the variants place their data behind this payload wall. And for a little context on the asset structure, material variants are used for LOD in our pipeline. And the off variant is, it has no params. It's basically just a no op. So we can turn the contributions off that way. So clients can quickly load massive scenes with payloads to say, well, they can configure the parameters to suit their use case on the assets and then re-enable re payloads and, and view the scene the way they want. So finally, uh, a few more performance-related notes. Uh, heavy files are stored as crate. Uh, we emit superfluous data like from the layers, so usernames, dates, comments, UUIDs, that kind of thing. So as a result, the asset interface and variant defining work stream layers are typically static, so we're not going to be repolling those and repolling those. Uh, the structure provides LOD controls, which I just talked about, and the anchored asset paths that we use optimize file lookups to get a little performance out of that. So that's it for me. Um, you can find more info at NVIDIA's OpenUSD documentation portal. Uh, Matt's white paper is linked there, and the DaVinci asset set or the DaVinci data set is going to be coming up sometime soon. So if we have time, uh, Matt and I are happy to answer any questions if you guys have anything you want to know. And thanks for the time.